Okay, it looks like we're, we're uh, fully connected now. Uh, I'll give it just one more minute. We still have people joining there at a fairly rapid pace. Okay, let's 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 get going. Um, we can we can let people join as they do. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, thank, thanks very much for joining. Uh, my name is Conor O'Neill. I'm head of product at Nearform, and I'd, I'm really happy to actually to to welcome you all to this first installment of Decode. So this is a brand new web series. We haven't done it before, um, and we're focused on exploring real life daily challenges in the whole world of just building and deploying software, and hopefully we'll share some solutions to the various problems that, that people encounter in, in this world we live in. Um, before we begin, just a few basic housekeeping notes. Um, you know, all, all attendees are muted. Um, we Obviously, we'd love to hear your thoughts, but just from a, a, you know, an audio quality perspective, it's better if you're all muted. Um, but we would like to hear from you. So, you know, uh, for anyone obviously who's been on a Zoom, and I'm sure most of you have at this stage, there's a Q&A button, uh, down the bottom there. So feel free throughout, you know, the next 30 or so minutes uh, that we're, we'll be talking to pop your questions in there. Uh, we'll address them all uh, at the end. You know, we may address them kind of implicitly as we go along, but um, we'll directly uh, deal with them at, at, for, at a few minutes uh, at the end. Uh, also, just so you know, this is being recorded. Um, it will be available for playback both on nearform.com and YouTube. And it is also being live streamed uh, to YouTube and LinkedIn. Um, so hopefully uh, I don't say anything out of turn. Um, now, so on to today, uh, we're going to talk about front end sprawl, you know, find out what that means, why it's a problem, and hopefully how do we navigate our way out of it. Um, and I really, I'd, you know, delighted to welcome our panelists here. We've got Sarah G. Mancia and Damien Beres Beresford. They're both technical directors here in Near, Near Form and both have many, many years experience engineering, you know, serious solutions for, for global clients. They have a ton of experience in this whole area. Um, and not only with, you know, the, the, obviously the challenges caused by this sort of fragmented, bloated front end technology landscape that we're all dealing with. Um, but they actually know how to fix these problems and they understand why fixing them is, is so much more than, you know, let's say a, a technical thing that you do. There, there's a lot more to it. So I'm really delighted to, for you both to join us here, guys, and I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to getting into th this conversation. So I'll, I'll kick off the questions and um, let's see how, how we get along. Um, so you both, as I said, spent lots of time talking to customers, building solutions. You're going to see patterns, you know, repeated uh, over and over again. So can we start with maybe just like what is, you know, what do you understand by this term kind of front end sprawl and maybe a little bit about how we, how we actually got here? Yeah, thanks, Connor. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, even the term front end is a little bit old fashioned, right? Okay, I think we're kind of showing our age. Uh, but I guess what we mean by that is, you know, uh, any applications, mainly web applications, you know, websites are very complicated things these days, they can be portals to a myriad of other applications. And we're talking about web apps, you know, but basically any interface that the, your client or your customer will use to access your business or your service. Okay, so that's kind of roughly what we mean by front end. Uh, in terms of sprawl, yeah, I mean, the sprawl is one word for it. There are other words we could use as well, but this is a family show. Uh, but we have seen an explosion, I guess, of, uh, you know, front end applications over the last few years. Uh, how do we get here? Um, Everybody is digitizing these days. All of our clients, they're innovating. Some are going through digital transformation programs. Uh, some are trying to disrupt the markets that they're in. Some are trying not to be disrupted. Uh, but by and large, everybody is trying to improve their customer experience, trying to improve their customer journeys. Uh, and uh, this has really resulted in a huge amount of front end uh, code and applications that has been written uh, over the last while. Uh, and I guess why this is a challenge. Um, yeah, it is a challenge. It's, uh, you know, they've been built with a myriad of technologies over the last few years, uh, front end technologies in particular, right? Uh, they're kind of very hard to maintain, right? They're not very well integrated uh, at times, okay? They're often poorly architected. Um, you know, cross-platform uh, is a bit of an issue in itself, right? Okay, so that's, you know, running, you know, on, on web, Android and iOS. 
Uh, but yeah, there's an awful lot of technical debt out there and there's even a huge amount of legacy, right? Uh, even apps that are only a couple of years old are now legacy. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there's challenges everywhere. And, and actually on that, because I know I'm, I'm terrible for conflating the two terms. So when we say technical debt and we say legacy, you see those as very, very different things. Right? Yeah, slightly different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, technical debt is basically the, the code you need to write today for all the, the shortcuts you took yesterday. Uh, and, and all of that builds up over time. Okay. But technical, technical debt can be addressed with enough investment. Okay. Uh, but at a certain point, uh, as in everything else with life, right, uh, in life, right, something becomes legacy. There's only so many times you can, you can fix your washing machine before you actually have to throw it away, right, and get a new one. Uh, so unfortunately, when things really are in a legacy state where it's way, you know, it's becoming far too expensive to maintain it anymore, uh, your only real option is to migrate. Okay. And, and is that, you know, is, is that something you can just do or, or is there... You know, assuming not but is there is there more to it than just this you know, the technical challenge of saying hey let's just use some new tech and you know sort sort out our our issues is there something more fundamental that has to be addressed there? um yeah well i guess you know most organizations that have an app portfolio will have apps in various different states right you know uh, some will be approaching end of life or legacy and you know people will know about it uh, and then they need to, to plan and, and replace those or you know build a new platform or whatever um, if it's a question of mindset, I think then, you know, uh, we kind of see, I can think we see three different mindsets and when people are building applications, right? There's project, product, and platform. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, now projects, everybody understands. Okay. They, they have a start date, they have a budget, they have an end date. Uh, it's very easy to get funding for a project because it's a single thing. Okay. Uh, however, a lot of, mis- you know, we see some, some customers where they don't really you know, appreciate how long, it, you know, sorry, the total cost of that project in the long run. Okay, the cost of maintenance is very high and stuff. Okay. Uh, the product mindset, uh, which is kind of a staple in, our, in the software industry, right, but not so much for, for a lot of our clients. Uh, so there is no end date, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're mainly KPI driven. Okay, so, you know, they have to hit certain KPIs or, or kind of the, the initiative may be killed. Uh, they're never done, right? So there's a you know a, light, a mentality of continuous improvement, continuous change, right? The, you know you start with an MVP and you iterate and you go from there. Uh, they're slightly harder to fund because they take you know more investment, right? Um, because it basically is not a project; it doesn't have an end date. Uh, and then by platform, and I know in the software industry, like platform must be one of the most mm-hmm. overloaded terms in a, in an industry of overloaded terms, right? <laughs> Uh, but the pro- platform approach that I'm talking about uh, is really a way of uh, modularizing your products. Okay, so combining your products together in such a way that they, they, they all kind of uh, can be, you know, combined together and industrialized and, and you can use common pieces, you can use, you know, different pieces from each one to address different needs of the customer or whatever. Um, and these work out really, really, really well, right? But they're a huge investment. You're talking about a macro level investment, right? That will kind of sometimes span several divisions or you know departments in a in a large enterprise. So much, much harder to get funding for a for a platform play. And and actually on that, uh, Sergi, you know the when we're uh, Damien mentioned cross platform there, and you know the concept of platform, you know. What sort of complexity does that cause? This idea of you can't just do web anymore. So, like, what, what, what world of right. pain are you getting yourself into uh, when, when you head towards a cross-platform world? So, um, when we talk about cross-platform, we basically uh, are talking about web and um, and the mobile platforms, right? And anybody who has uh, an app and wants to reach uh, a significant amount of customers, you have to be thinking on um, on iOS and Android, which are two. The two main platforms, and they are the they're very different platforms. So what what that means effectively is that you need two teams uh, of developers developing for each platform. Damien was talking about about was talking before about technical debt. Um, when you have two teams on two different platforms developing two apps that are the same real really the same app, but in different in different platforms, you develop um, you you produce um, two sets of technical then right and if you have a web version you there's a third one so each team is producing um technical debt that is different from uh, the other teams because each platform has its intricacies and its uh, characteristics right so um 
um, the complexity is not only on people because we need more people with different skill set, uh, a very particular set of skills because each platform, iOS and Android, are um, are uh, very broad and uh, and and big platforms with complex APIs. Um, so people who develop on this platform have to have a, a deep knowledge about about this platform that keeps updating every year, obviously, with the new versions of operating systems and new APIs and so on. So effectively, um, if you want to reach most customers uh, via your apps or you want to uh, have customers um, use the web um, to, to, to reach your functionality, what you're offering to them, you are um, looking at having three platforms somehow. Um, in the best of cases, if you have the... Uh, the uh, the budget and the resources you can have three teams working together but even in that case it's very very hard to keep uh, feature parity be between apps because you might start synchronized but uh, to keep that synchronization between uh, different platforms different apps and the web it uh, it becomes really really hard right um, so yeah I mean you're looking at a at a at a pretty um, considerable complexity when developing uh, front end nowadays. And, and look, you know, we've been uh, mentioned at the start, you know, the two of you have been involved in a lot of app development over the years, a lot of different types of app, both the kind of enterprise and, and, um, and consumer. And I know we as an organization have been building this series of things that have been termed uh, accelerators that address you know, various challenges that people have in different areas. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention that more uh, at the end as, as we're wrapping up in the, the overall accelerator space. But this specific problem, you know, from a, a, a technical uh, point of view, you, you have both been involved in coming to address it. Can you tell me a little bit about that and that, you know, how you went about it and, you know, what, I won't say, you know, the silver bullet, but what is what, what the approach is to actually deal with the problem you described there? Damien, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I wasn't sure if you were going to take that or not. Uh, yeah, so I guess um, there's a couple of technology trends and um, architectural trends that are, 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 you know, we're seeing more and more of, okay. Uh, on the cross-platform side, or, or, you know, React Native has improved hugely over the last few years, almost to the point, I think, now where it's, it could be classified as a disruptive technology. Uh, GraphQL is, is becoming more and more popular. Uh, it really kind of uh, enforces that decoupling between the, the, the front end and the back end, and often between the back end services as well. Uh, and then componentization of the front end, I think, is, is a huge trend over the last few years, too. Right? And, and you know, that's something that we've had on the back end for you know, uh, if what feels like forever. Uh, but it's only in the last few years that you can have proper you know, components or packages. Uh, and modules uh, on, on your front end, yeah. Uh, so in terms of the, the cross-platform stuff, yeah, we, we have this, what we call an accelerator called Polaris. Uh, it's, uh, it's an approach to cross-platform development using React Native. Um, it's React Native uh, plus about, you know, maybe 10 or 15 other open source tools uh, that, that all combine together to provide a kind of our opinionated way about how these, you know, applications and platforms uh, should be built. Okay, and and so this is all. I, I assume is this all open source? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and and, and, the, and the things that relies on obviously are open source. Exactly. As well. Yeah, yeah. And I think what it does really well is that uh, you know getting all of these tools to work together sounds fine, right? But it's actually mm. it's hard to keep them in lockstep as they all improve. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. That, that I was I was going to say the accelerator concept that we've developed at Nearform. We have. Uh, we're, we're here talking about front end, but we have other areas. And these are just ways. Um, so at Nearform, we we um, we work with many customers um, every year. We we develop a very different kind of applications and client servers apps, um, front end um, native applications. So um, whenever we see a pattern that we keep repeating or uh, some approaches that keep coming up, we try to internally, like many other organizations, but we, we try to intentionally make a package out of it and we call it an accelerator. And then uh, uh, some of those um, turn out that are can be very useful to other people. And uh, what happens is that at, at, at Nearform, we uh, we can provide the, um, the configuration of these accelerators that has worked for us and probably will work for you um, because we have been distilling and, uh, and 
testing and testing what works and whatnot. So Polaris is one of those for the front end. And uh, Polaris is basically um, more, more a philosophy than just an open source project. The, the code part, the, the, the open source project is just a technical part that you deploy, but it has to go hand in hand with a new way of, um, of uh, organizing teams and organizing uh, uh, development flow and so on. Um, Polaris is a is an open source is a very opinionated open source project that you could call uh, some sort of a scaffold um, or a starter project for uh, for React Native. The difference is it comes with uh, with some philosophies built in um, and some tools that have worked for us. Like uh, Damien was talking about componentization, um, we use Storyboard, which has become um, very popular to um, especially if you are if you're developing for customers. Um, uh, tools like Storyboard allows you to uh, not having to have the app fun the, the the functional app in order to show it to the customer, but you can you can uh, uh, show the components and you can show the app itself mocked up as you develop on a different environment, right? And you can um, model states, you can mock different states of the of the of whatever component, whatever screen, or the app itself uh, to show in parallel with your development, so you don't have to rush feature just to be able to show it to other people that also helps developers to see and designers to work together because the designer doesn't need the developer and the developer doesn't need the designer to keep um a parallel flow, uh, 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 to keep working on a feature right um and with that it also comes like we have um plenty of tools in it we have um for example we have state machine x, x state uh, built in has worked for us uh, CSS in JS and so on, um, but we don't. We try to uh, be opinionated, but not constrained too much. Like for example, the uh, Polaris default app comes with access to some of the APIs and some um, some suggestions, so the developer can pick and choose whatever will work for the current project. Um, yeah, and so so uh, yeah. And and but actually on that, so uh, the the idea of it being opinionated and it being kind of giving you these guides, um, does that play very well in in I suppose a lot of big companies for you know rather than saying here just just use React Native like it's just it's there go 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 do it you're actually getting them you know on the right path is that is that the intent behind just to make their lives easier yeah. And, yeah, I can. I mean, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I can give an example of that, right? So one of our clients in the states, uh, they they have a vision for, I guess, accelerated, you know, software development, increasing the 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 business impact, you know, which I guess is a vision that everybody has, right? Uh, but for them, what's important was um, at the moment they have kind of um, multiple channels, right? Okay, so a channel for web, a channel for Android, a channel for iOS. Uh, and they wanted this kind of omni-channel approach uh, from a development perspective where they had feature parity across all three platforms, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, this was a real business problem, okay? Uh, you could, the customer experience was very disjointed depending on what uh, platform you were on, okay? So you could do certain things on Android, do certain things on web, etc. cetera. Uh, and also, I guess their, their, their back end needed a little bit of help as well. They had kind of... Um, followed a very traditional kind of Conway's law uh, approach where, you know, their system design pretty much effectively was a copy of their, you know, internal communication uh, structure. Uh, so they wanted to set up a kind of a, almost a, an inverse Conway's law approach to it, which is another architectural pattern that we're seeing a lot of these days. So that kind of flips Conway's law on its head and says uh, that you organize your teams around the architecture that you want, right? And so you basically build your desired architecture, you know, focusing on whatever, whatever architectural you know, features that you want or, or constraints, uh, and then you build out your, your teams from there, okay? Uh, but on the front end, sorry, on the, the customer journey side then, right? So what does that actually look like? Well, a lot of it was architecture led, okay? So we helped them basically with the, to define what this cross-platform approach is, uh, you know, using Polaris, you know, how, this, how you can get feature parity across all three. So we, we helped them through a kind of a proof of concept or a Lighthouse project. Uh, there was also a lot of design in terms of how to do this loose coupling between services uh, and also as well how to do components properly on the front end. I think that was a kind of a massive thing, right? Uh, and this is a very big team. It's about 150 people, right? Uh, right, okay. You know, it's, a, it's a fairly big, this is what I mean by, you know, platform plays are very expensive, right? Okay, this mm. is a, 
Uh, this is a big thing, okay? Uh, the other thing that we put in place was a, a kind of an, an enablement team. Okay, so this was the team that, you know, uh, that worked on the platform, worked on the tooling, worked on the reference architecture, okay, and basically put, you know, an amazing developer experience in place for any of the feature teams that were coming in behind them to, to, to deliver, you know, features on the platforms. Uh, and then finally, as well, training was a big part of it, right? So, you know, training in React Native, training in GraphQL, uh, but not just generic, you know, React Native training, right? It's training yeah, that is very specific to their context, okay? So using the reference architecture, using the tools and technologies that they have in their platform, uh, as well as layering on top the fundamentals of React Native and the fundamentals of GraphQL and stuff. So, yeah, very, very big, ambitious program. Yeah, but it goes to show how... Uh, these technologies are not just, you know, not just good for kind of small teams, right? But yeah. they can actually, you know, have a serious impact on on organizational uh, shape. And, and that that's particularly interesting to me that it's not saying, you know, here's React Native. It's a it's a technologically perfect thing. It's actually talking about the business impacts that you can have by by taking a specific approach. Um, and, you know, you've obviously talked about enterprise there. We do a huge amount of enterprise apps. Um, would there be any apps in a consumer sense that we might have done recently that this also <laughs> might be applicable to? Yeah, well, we did the, the, the nine COVID tracking applications, right, for Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Gibraltar. I'm not going to name all nine because I'm ah, cool. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, they're built in React Native, right? Uh, they target Android and, and, and iOS. <laughs> Uh, and we were really, really happy with that approach. Um, it, it's a fantastic approach. In fact, it worked out really, really well. Um, so it's delighted with all that. Uh, all nine applications are different as well. Okay, so it yeah. wasn't just taking one app and reskinning it and then reskinning it again. Um, far from it. Uh, now the back end and the infrastructure was, you know, shared across all nine. And people are people are often surprised by how busy the back ends are. Like so, the, I mean, the Irish back end alone processes about 17 million requests per day, you know. Um, but, you know, that's a different story, really, if we're focusing on the, the, the front end, uh, then yeah, it is really good. And even for like, you know, if you're just addressing one platform, right? So if you're okay. just addressing Android, right? Uh, then React Native still makes a lot of sense. Uh, because, you know, Android itself is tends to be quite fragmented, um, you know, and you can have different, uh, different problems, cross versions or whatever. So React Native actually provides a layer of abstraction on top of all of the different Android versions too. So, you know, even does, for one one platform, it, it you know it makes a lot of sense. But does and I suppose I possibly a question for Sergey there. Does that are there are there issues with that? Are there issues with abstracting away the the native APIs? I mean, you know, for for let's say the vast majority of developers out there, are they going to hit limits where they go? Actually, I you know I, I can't get yeah, to I mean, X, I can't get to Y in, in terms of. Look, React Native as a as a platform, well, the 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 approach that we're taking is because it's the it's it's eminently practical and allows us to uh, go to make very high quality apps and go fast making them and uh, have a very diverse team of developers collaborate easily on apps. Why? Because what what Damien was talking about before about componentization of the of the front end, we can share components um, between apps. We can. We can have developer. We can recycle developers. Let's. I, I don't love the term, but you can you can take uh, React React developers, which is the thing is React uh, wanted or not um, has become kind of a standard in uh, UI programming, right? It came from uh, from a web programming, but it turns out that the model and the architecture of React is uh, it's pretty appealing and it's uh, it's easy to understand. You don't have to buy in a huge massive framework. It's not. It's, uh, it's easy to get, many developers use it, and it's relatively easy to find uh, developers that are comfortable with React. And from React to React Native, it's a, it's a small step. Um, you need some training, but it's not that much. So the thing is, we're not advocating, we're not saying React Native is better than Native. You should, you know, a React Native uh, application is better, in, is, is better than an Android application. It's not, but it's more practical in many, in many ways, right? So, yes. Um, if you do a React Native application, um, 99%, uh, let's let's say 90% of, of cases in which you want to make an application, React Native will be more than enough for you. Um, what are the cases in which React Native could not be enough? Um, so for example, if you want to use um, a very, very new API that has not yet been, been ported or bridged, 
you'll have to jump uh, to native to do some native code. Uh, if you do want to do really high performance stuff like games or uh, or AR um, stuff that needs like uh, quick performance, like uh, um, millisecond reactions and all. Well, maybe React Native is not what you want in that case. But now in reality, um, most apps are not about that. Most apps um, are about having screens, clicking around, changing. And React Native is a way to get 60 frames per second um, with just um, coding in JavaScript and having a React interface to the device. So I think that many people, and I, I have that impression because we, we've spoken with, with a couple of customers that had this, um, this impression. Um, and I think that many people still uh, have uh, a bit of a confused um, concept of React Native and they think that it's, uh, it's somehow WebKit based. Like previous, in the past, uh, it was there were some platforms um, that helped bridge the gap between native and JavaScript on the web, uh, like PhoneGap and others uh, that were great at the time, but uh, they were not native code. They were not using native uh, UI. What, uh, what they did is just like use a web, get a browser view and, uh, and run a web app inside the browser view, which was fine, but it was, um, it was, it didn't have the performance that native can offer and it could not access many of the APIs of the device. It was very limited. Um, and I think that many people stayed with that view and said like, yeah, no, when you, whenever you code JavaScript for native, it just doesn't work well. And it's, uh, it's not true anymore. I mean, the, 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 the example of, in, in our case is the COVID apps, right? Mm. Massively successful apps. Nobody would um, even think about the speed or the performance because it's, it feels native and it's on React Native. And probably yeah. most people that are watching this right now, they, you have uh, at least half of the apps in your phone are React Native at that point. It's, it's very used, it's very uh, capable and it works for us. It's not to say it's the perfect solution in any case. It's, uh, it just works to deliver fast, to deliver uh, performing apps uh, and diverse teams and to leverage um, knowledge that you might already have in your organization or in your team. Uh, that, that's context is everything. Everything we say yeah. here, actually, we should prefix with uh, context is everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, and I think, I think that, <laughs> and, and then, uh, so yeah. React Native is one part, right? But we were talking about Polaris and I think that uh, our take, uh, any software developer knows that the actual easiest part of the job is writing the business logic of your app. Um, most of the time, most of the complexity of the projects comes from the environment in, you have to in which you have to deploy. Or in the case of front end, if you want to develop a new web or a new app right now, and you go out there and it's like, oh, let's see what's, what's the state of the art. What should I use to develop um, front end? And it's, it's incredibly overwhelming. Even for people who work every day with these technologies, it's, it's overwhelming. Every week there's something new. Should I use React? Should I use Vue? Should I use Angular? Um, oh, I'm reading that React Native is uh, does this, but this other platform. There's all there's also um, what's Google's platform. There's there's several platforms that do the same. Okay, so, get onto that one in a second. Actually, that's one of the questions. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's very confusing, and and there is no if you read about it, if you look at the internet, there's no wrong choice. There's no <laughs> technology clearly better than other. That that's what I should choose. So I think that what we can provide is. Look, we do that for a living, and we're many. We 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 do many projects, and that's what worked for us. And as, and we think that this is this very a very good solution to develop applications. Is that the only way? No, but it's opinionated because it works for us. So that's there is this part uh, of, of of truth that you can take home. It's like this this if this works for these guys that do a lot of this stuff, maybe it works for me too. Excellent. And, and I, so I suppose my last question I'll, I'll, I'll put to Damien, we do have some, some attendee questions as well, but how do people get started, Damien? Like if, if you want to send somebody on their way on this path, what, what would you say is the first thing you need to do? Contact us, no? <laughs> fair, that is fair. No, uh, <laughs> aside, yeah. uh, I think, yeah, in terms of React Native, I mean, we'd always, you know, recommend that, that you start with, you know, an architecture approach actually have a think about it think what your requirements are uh you know choose the appropriate technologies and, and components and everything else that you need right uh but what we find uh most effective is like when we're working with clients who want to evaluate this approach is just build a lighthouse project or build a proof of concept okay, okay. so take a very difficult journey through your existing uh one of your existing apps uh, something that you think would be you know quite a challenging 
uh, do it using this approach, right? Uh, you know, just, you know, rewrite it, do it, but do it properly, okay? So use things like the atomic design, you know, use Storybook, use, you know, everything that we use in this approach. Don't just hack something in React Native, okay? Actually try and follow the approach, right? Uh, and then you'll see the benefits of componentization. You'll see the benefits of, of, um, uh, of kind of, you know, vertical slices. And, you know, it kind of opens up a world of opportunities uh, to you. Um, and then, you know, we, we typically help people with those proof of concepts. You know, you get it running on web, uh, Android and iOS. Uh, that provides a fairly good, um, it, it completely de-risks your investment, really. Okay, if you do, if you do a good POC, it can substantially de-risk, uh, you know, any concerns about, you know, replatforming or retooling. Um, and it would also, it's a learning thing as well, right? I mean, you'll learn what, you know, you need to do in order to, to roll it out at scale or, or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, start small um, and follow the approach. And uh, yeah. Great. No, no, that's, 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 that's spot on. And actually on that, just in terms of the, the approach and, you know, the, the fact that there's, there's, there's a lot more to software development than the, the little piece you've talked about here to talk a little bit more about the, the decoded series. So, you know, near form teams tend to be very full stack. So, you know, lot, lots of the people working on near form teams are full stack developers and not just front end. And they have a lot of challenges they have to deal with. So over the next couple of months, and we're doing these, currently we'll be working on doing these uh, once a month. We're going to be talking about that really the entire gamut. And that's everything from like DevOps, you know, lots to do with JavaScript accessibility, design led development and, and Lots of other topics. I mean, Damien mentioned GraphQL earlier on as well. Um, and we hope to just cover all the things people who are building modern web apps are, in, are interested in uh, right now. And I, so, like, thanks a million, guys. I mean, I've, I've learned a ton here. I, I hope the audience has. We do have a couple of questions from them. And we're, we've run a little bit over time, but we're actually doing, we're doing all right. Um, so I'm, I'm rather pleased with that. So I suppose back to Sergi, back to you, because you, you couldn't think of it when you were speaking, and I, I couldn't think of it either. So Dylan asked if we have any opinions on Flutter, which is obviously Google's uh, cross-platform um, system. Hey, Sergi, are you typing the response? <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I lost you there. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, so the question was, do we have it any all, opinions? It froze up. Oh, it could have been me, there. sorry. Probably my children playing, I don't know, in Fortnite or something. Uh, any opinions on Flutter at all? Yes, I do have opinions on Flutter. <laughs> ah, <laughs> um, nicely said. <laughs> well, no, I looked into it because it's it's very interesting and it's a very impressive uh, piece of technology. Um, but I wouldn't choose it for a serious project myself, at least yet. Um, the reasons are, there are several reasons for it. And uh, I think, that, first of all, it's a Google product. What does that mean? I don't have anything against Google in particular, but Google is has a very bad, um, uh, you know, fame for dropping technology and products whenever it's not convenient or hasn't gotten enough traction for them. Um, so, you know, there's that. Um, it's not a Flutter uses there. There, there are many reasons inside that main reason. Also, the the main language on Flutter is Dart. Is a language developed by Google. It's a it's a neat language, but it hasn't gotten any traction either. Um, nobody, you know, you go back. You basically have the disadvantage of, of coding native because go out and find a developer who knows Dart at this yeah. point. It's it's much harder. Um, and then uh, you're depending on you're depending too much on 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 Google and very particular tech. So you're depending on uh, on them continuing development because it's mainly led by Google. You're depending on a very particular language. Whenever it goes away, nobody can maintain that code base. Um, Flutter also takes a different approach and basically uses the Skia um, rendering engine, which means that everything in Flutter is, is actually rendered on a bitmap. Let's call it like it's an image. It's rendering, uh, it's very high, high performance C++ code, very performant, but it's not um, using the native UIs as React Native is. The result is that for example, if you want to make a native UI, a, a UI that looks exactly the same as native, Flutter provides the images and all the resources so that your app uses components that look exactly like the ones in Android in that current version or in, or in iOS. But if uh, imagine the next iPhone comes out um, or the next iOS, sorry, and it changes the appearance of iOS like they always do in subtle ways. Um, they change buttons here and there. 
Um, then Flutter, uh, your project in Flutter won't look like that. They have to catch up to that. And it takes a while because everything is rendered as an image. Um, there, there are more things. It's just, um, to me, it's too much of a liability, um, depending on what you, for, for, a, for, a, for a side project, that's fine. For something serious, I think Flutter is too much of a liability at this point to bet anything on it. Um, it's a cool technology, but it just, the problem is not with the tech itself. Um, it's about, it's not established. It's, it's uh, it using too many Google technologies that are not um, spread yet. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, in my opinion, it doesn't have the same appeal as React Native um, in the way it treats the native UI. Um, okay, I, 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 that sounds very. I mean, I've I've talked to a few people who have very similar views on it as well. That that particularly ecosystem and, and maturity and so on. It's cool. Um, it's tempting when you when you first see it. It's like, yeah. oh my god, this is amazing because it's very it's very well architected. Um, I just I just too much too risk too much risk. Yeah, I I hear that. Uh, we have a question then from John. I think he, Damien is talking about the the. the a large uh, project and large customer mm. you were referring to earlier. So did the project succeed in delivering a single omni platform solution or are there still three platform teams? No, it is working, yeah. Uh, so it's working, but we're in that kind of transition phase, right? So the systems that it's replacing are going to sunset in Q1 next year. Uh, and, you know, we're kind of easing in gently, but yes, it, it, it is working. Oh, that's fabulous. Excellent. Uh, and then we have two from James. Uh, I don't know if I've seen those four characters in, in a very long time. He said, what recommendation would you have to migrate a XAML app to the web cloud? Ooh, a XAML app. Yeah, that's, um, that sounds <laughs> like an interesting project. Speaking of legacy. Yeah. Um, now, I think, I think that um, actually it fits, you know, it's a different model and uh, there's no there's no right answer. And maybe I don't know everything there is. I know that Xamarin does cross-platform as well. And I don't know how much of a XAML integration they have since they are very close to Microsoft. So that could be a good option, but I, I don't know enough about it. Um, what I would say is that um, honestly, it wouldn't be that crazy to migrate to React Native. You have, um, you know, and you have the JSX um, uh, interface language, which is close to the XML that XAML uses. Um, probably a same a similar set of components that you can substitute. So, I mean, in my I'm very biased, but I would go definitely for React Native because um, the way you will build the UI um, would not be that different. Now the paradigm is so. Um, but yeah, migrating XAML to the web or to a to a mobile front end, I don't think there's a you know I don't think it's there's anything really portable. As I said, maybe Xamarin did, did something uh, about it because they, they used to be a lot about uh, Microsoft uh, UI and so on, mm. but, um, but I, would, I would go for React Native, yeah. And, and uh, another question there, which is something myself and Damien would have had to deal with a lot in the past, which is uh, any recommendations on a hybrid desktop cloud route to go for when the connection is lost and you need to sync up you know, after reconnection, so your classic offline behavior and so on. Uh, I don't know, Sergi, do we have any kind of options like that in React Native out of the box or? Um, hybrid desktop cloud route. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Well, it's more, I think but, it's more to do with just offline behavior. Like does React, does, you know. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, you, you right. can use a CQRS pattern or something like that, right? So, uh, to... No, I mean, yeah, there's, um, right. So what I would use, um, for that is uh, probably some kind of um, PouchDB configuration. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a lot of, um, I, I particularly like PouchDB a lot um, yeah. and it can, it can, um, so PouchDB is, uh, is, is basically CouchDB ported to a client JavaScript, but that doesn't mean that you have to use CouchDB on the back end necessarily. It just makes for a very offline um, platform on the client. Um, and you can base it on several technologies like, uh, you know, um, IndexedDB or Web, Web SQL or local storage. And it's uh, it's worked very well from in the past. And in the backend, you can have um, any backend that uh, a node that can uh, use the level up, level down um, interfaces, which are many. There's adapters for Postgres for, for any database. Um, that will be my go-to right now, but uh, that space is moving fast. So uh, that could um, that could change that could change soon. But uh, to be honest, I haven't seen I haven't seen any 
besides Pipes DB, um, I have not seen many um, seamless offline technologies uh, client server and uh, on the web, based on the web. Okay. Right. Uh, just checking here to see if there's any. Oh, there's one more. Uh, currently using, yeah, SQL DB. Oh, they mentioned Firebase as well. Uh, does Firebase work for yeah, Firebase? Is, F Firebase, yeah, Firebase has its, yeah. I mean, but of course, you have to be on Firebase. So um, yeah. it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good um, solution and API, but you have to buy on the product. So I, yeah, you know, not enough. for everybody. True enough. Um, I think that's it for questions, uh, and we're, we're we are well over the thirty minutes, so uh, I'll I think I'll, I'll call it all there. Uh, thanks a million, Damien and Sergi. Uh, as I said earlier on, I I, I learned a, a huge amount there. Um, any final comments at all? No, not for me. No, no not really. No. Oh, great. Okay. Well, um, as a, thanks for all the attendees and uh, look forward to talking to you all uh, next month. Um, and with that, we'll call it a day. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, thanks everyone. Connor. Bye.